Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Into the Killing. In this week's episode, we're going to discuss the murders of two people who worked in the music industry. For our first case, we're going back to July 1993. For fans of alternative rock, specifically grunge music, if they had a time machine, they would probably want to visit Seattle, Washington in the late 1980s and early 1990s. If you're not familiar with grunge music, the genre first emerged in the 1980s in the Seattle area. It's a type of rock music that uses punk and heavy metal elements. Some of the earliest grunge bands are The Melvins, Soundgarden, and Green River. Green River didn't have much success outside of Seattle, but members of the band would go on to form some of the most notable rock bands of the 1990s. This includes Mudhoney, Mother Love Bone, Temple of the Dog, and Pearl Jam. Grunge became mainstream in 1991 when Nirvana released their sophomore album, Nevermind. Their single, Smells Like Teen Spirit, launched the band into superstardom. Today, Nevermind is one of the best-selling albums of all time and critically is considered one of the greatest albums of all time. The same year that Nirvana released Nevermind, several other classic grunge albums were released, including Soundgarden's Bad Motor Finger and Pearl Jam's 10. Alice in Chains' debut album, Facelift, hit the shelves a year earlier. Initially, Facelift didn't get much attention, but in 1991, Alice in Chains garnered a large fan base and their music videos were regularly being played on MTV. In September 1991, Facelift became the first grunge album to be certified gold, meaning they had sold half a million records. In 1991, one band that was starting to get recognition was The Gits, fronted by Mia Zapata. Zapata was born in August 1965 in Louisville, Kentucky. She was interested in music from a young age, and she learned to play the guitar and piano when she was nine years old. She liked a variety of music, including R&B, blues, country, and of course, punk. According to the Gits website, she was influenced by Bessie Smith, Billie Holiday, Jimmy Reed, Ray Charles, Hank Williams, and Sam Cooke. In 1984, Zapata went to Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Iowa as a liberal arts student. In the spring of 1986, she was at an open mic night and Matt Dresner saw her perform. When Dresner saw her perform, he was blown away. He told Rolling Stone to me everything sounded like Joan Baez or Fish. Then there was Mia. I remember what she opened with, maybe Bessie Smith. Maybe something she wrote. Whatever it was, I was transfixed and overcome. I cried. It was raw, honest, to the bone and from the heart. No music or musician had ever affected me like she did that night. Dresner played the bass and they were soon joined by guitarist Joe Spleen and drummer Steve Mortiarty. Initially their name was the Sniveling Little Rat Face Gits, which is a reference to a Monty Python skit but they later shortened the name to the Gits. In 1989, the band relocated to Seattle to further their career. They moved into a rundown house they called the Rat House, which doubled as their practice space. Other bands like the DC Beggars and Seven Year Bitch also practiced there. In 1991, the Gits went on many successful tours on the West Coast with bands like Nirvana, Green Day, Back in Sublime. They even toured Europe. In November 1992, the Gits released their debut album, Fredging the Bully, on Seattle based CZ Records. In the summer of 1993, they were working on their second album, Enter the Conquering Chicken. 1993 seemed like it would be a big year for the Gits. They had two American tours and a European tour planned. Also, there were rumors that Atlantic Records was going to sign them. We're just going to take a short break to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Best Fiends. Sometimes I find it hard to get breaks during the day. I work from home, so I just constantly feel like I should be working or doing chores or doing family stuff. So, this is really embarrassing. I really appreciate my alone time in the washroom because I'll play Best Fiends. And last week, I was so committed to being a level that my legs actually fell asleep because I had been sitting down so long and I could barely walk away from the washroom. 
If you've never checked out Best Fiends for yourself, you should, because it's free to download. It's an amazing match-free game that I can't put down. It turned out that one of my friends is even more obsessed than I am. I've been playing for a few months, and I'm on level 293. I convinced my friend to download the game a couple weeks ago, and he's on level 347. But that was a few hours ago when I asked him, so who knows what level he's on now. Best Fiends has thousands of levels, and there are always new fun events. You should give yourself a break and see why my friend and I are so into Best Fiends. We're not the only ones who love this game. It's been downloaded over 100 million times. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. On the evening of July 6, 1993, Mia Zapata, who was 27, went out drinking with some friends in Seattle. The Gits were home for a few days before heading out on tour. Their second album was mostly recorded and it was in post-production. Zapata left the bar at around midnight to find her ex-boyfriend. She thought he might be in a rehearsal space in an apartment building, but he wasn't. So Zapata went to the apartment of a friend who lived in the same building. She left at about 2 a.m. She was walking alone and she was listening to her Walkman. At about 3.20 a.m., a pedestrian came across Zapata's body on a deserted road about half a mile away from her friend's apartment. Her body was still warm. The person who found the body called 911 and first responders rushed the area. The 27-year-old Zapata was already dead by the time they got there. No identification was found on or around her body, so the police had no idea who she was. The medical examiner happened to be a fan of the local music scene, and he recognized her as the lead singer of the Gits. The medical examiner determined she had been strangled to death with a string from her hoodie. It was her own band's hoodie. She had also been severely beaten. Had she not been strangled to death, she would have died from the beating. She had also been raped. The police believe that Zapata was raped and murdered elsewhere, and that her body was dumped on the street. The actual location where a murder happened can yield a lot of clues. But the police had no idea where Zapata was killed, so they didn't have many clues. One piece of evidence they did have was a bite mark that was left on Zapata's breast. It was swabbed and saliva was found. But the DNA sample was too small to create a profile. The police were baffled by the crime. They eliminated Zapata's ex-boyfriend as a suspect pretty quickly. He had an alibi and he passed a polygraph exam. The police had no other suspects and it wasn't long before the case went cold. The rest of the band had benefit shows, which featured Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Nirvana, to raise money for a private investigator. In total, they raised $70,000. But the private investigator did not have much more luck than the police. The private investigator thought that the case would only be solved if the killer confessed to someone and they came forward, or because of advancements in DNA technology. In March 1994, the surviving members of the band released the album they were working on when Zapata was murdered. The last track on the album is called Sign of the Crab, which Zapata wrote. It is written from the point of view of a woman being murdered by a serial killer. Much of the dismay of Mia Zapata's friends, family, and fans, her case sat cold for years. The police wanted to have the DNA tested, but the experts were worried that because the sample was so small that they could destroy it without creating a profile. So they wanted to wait until technology improved to ensure that they could build a profile. That time finally came in 2001. A DNA expert used a process called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. It's basically a chemical photocopier that amplifies DNA into big enough pieces that they can be detected. 
It was developed by biochemist Harry Mullis in 1985. In 1993, the same year Sapat was murdered, he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Although the process was invented in 1985, it needed to be refined enough so that the DNA wouldn't be destroyed when they tested it. In 2001, they thought that the process was good enough, so they had the microscopic samples of DNA tested. Amazingly, they were able to create a male profile. It was then entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. But fortunately, no match was found. So Miyazapa's case was cold once again. A year went by, and then Kodus found a match. It belonged to 48-year-old Jesus Mesquia. Mesquia was born and raised in Cuba. In Cuba, he was a felon. Mesquia was exiled to the United States in 1980. He had a criminal record in Florida and Arizona. In 1997, Mesquia was convicted of aggravated assault involving a pregnant woman. When his DNA was matched as a past murder, he was on probation and living in Marathon, Florida. Seattle investigators interviewed him and showed him a photo lineup of women, including a picture of Mia Zapata. He denied knowing any of the women. When he did that, the investigators knew that they had him. If he had said he had met Zapata and they had sex, it could have possibly explained why his DNA was on her. But he was adamant he didn't know who she was. The police learned that when Zapata was murdered, Mesquia lived about three blocks away from where her body was dumped. So in January 2003, 48-year-old Jesus Mesquia was arrested for the murder of Mia Zapata. He went to trial March 2004, 11 years after the murder. The jury deliberated for three days. He was found guilty of first-degree murder. In May 2004, he was sentenced to 36 and a half years in prison. Jesus Mejia died in the hospital on January 21, 2021. He was 66 years old. For the second case today, we're going nearly across the country to another city that's famous for its music scene. That's Nashville, Tennessee, which has the nickname Music City. According to the City of Nashville's website, the city settlers celebrated with fiddle music and buck dances. In the 1800s, the city's most famous musical act was Fisk Jubilee Singers, an African-American a cappella ensemble that was made up of students from Fisk University. They were supposedly the first musical act to go on an around-the-world tour. In 1925, the radio station WSM was established in Nashville, and they started broadcasting a live show featuring country music, which later became known as the Grand Old Opry. WSM and the Grand Old Opry cemented Nashville as the home of country and western music. Nearly 100 years later, WSM is still in operation and they still broadcast live shows of the Grand Old Opry. Like Seattle, Nashville is a mecca for musicians looking to make it big. But instead of grunge, country musicians from all over the world will move there in the hope of being discovered. Kevin Hughes moved to Nashville from Illinois in 1984 to attend Belmont University. While there, he interned at Cashbox Magazine, a music industry trade magazine that published record charts. Its biggest competitor was Billboard magazine. In 1986, Kevin left school to work full-time at the magazine. In early 1988, he became the director of the Top Country and Western chart. It was a dream job for Kevin Hughes. Ever since he was young, he had been obsessed with music ranking charts. He used to collect Billboard magazines and he even created his own rankings. After getting the job at Cashbox, it wasn't unusual for him to work overtime. This is exactly what Hughes was doing on the night of March 9th, 1989. 
At around 8.30 p.m., Hughes' friend, 22-year-old Sammy Sadler, stopped by his office. Sadler was an aspiring country musician who was working on his debut album. Hughes suggested they eat some dinner. So they went to a nearby restaurant. Afterward, they went to the office of Sadler's record label so that he could use the phone. While he was on the phone, they heard what sounded like someone trying to open the front door, but it was locked. Hughes checked out the noise, and he saw a man walking away from the door. He didn't get a good look at the man, but he thought he might have been black. After that, Hughes and Sadler decided to leave. They walked across the road to Hughes' car. As Sadler was getting into the passenger seat, a man wearing a ski mask shot him. Hughes ran, and the man chased after him, firing his gun. Hughes was shot, and he fell to the ground. Then the man stood over him and pumped two more bullets into the back of his head. The masked man then ran off into the night. 911 was called, and first responders arrived in the area. Sadly, it was too late to do anything for 23-year-old Kevin Hughes. He was dead by the time paramedics arrived. 22-year-old Sammy Sadler was badly wounded. A bullet had cut a major artery in his arm. He was rushed to the hospital, and he survived. Initially, the police thought that the case might not be too difficult to solve. Besides Sadler, there were four witnesses. Plus, the killer left behind a hat with hairs in it. But they were wrong about solving the case quickly. None of the witnesses got a good look at the shooter because he wore a mask. A witness noticed that the killer had an unusual side-to-side gait. As for the hat, it read, World War II veteran and damn proud of it, and then there was an illustration of an infantryman. It turned out that the black hairs inside the hat weren't human hair. It was cat hair. The police had three theories regarding the motive behind the murder. But they had major problems with all three theories. The first theory is that Hughes was killed because of his job. Hughes' work had seriously helped some artists get more record sales. So the police thought he was possibly killed because he was mixed up in a chart manipulation scam, or he refused to take part in one. It may have even been a professional hit. The problem with this theory is that, according to his supervisor, Hughes wasn't that important at work. If someone wanted him out of the way, he could have just been fired. They also found no evidence that Hughes was taking money to manipulate the charts. Secondly, if Hughes was targeted because of his work, Why wasn't he killed closer to his workplace or his home? On the night he was killed, he unexpectedly went out for dinner and they went to a record label's office. Both were unexpected trips. Also, if Hughes was the target, why was Sadler shot as well? Why not wait to get Hughes alone and then kill him? The police also thought that there was no way it was a professional hit. First off, there were too many witnesses. A professional assassin probably would have been more discreet. Secondly, a professional probably would have made sure that Sadler was dead as well. But once again, a professional probably would have killed Hughes when he was alone. A perfect time would have been when he was alone in his office. But instead, if it was a hitman, he risked being seen when he followed Hughes and Sadler to the restaurant and then to the office. The second theory is that Hughes and Sadler were killed in a robbery gone wrong. But when the gunman approached them, he didn't say anything, he just started shooting. Also, he didn't steal anything after he was done shooting. The third theory is that some deranged musical artist, promoter, or agent blamed Hughes for their song or their client's song not charting or not appearing high enough on the chart. This idea seemed the most far-fetched to the detectives. In January 1990, Unsolved Mysteries aired an episode featuring Kevin Hughes' case. 
One person who was interviewed was a promoter and cash box employee named Chuck Dixon. Dixon said that Hughes was one of the best people to rank music and he was always the fairest. Dixon thought that the killer could have been an angry musician or agent who needed someone to blame because their song wasn't successful. But he thought that was the only way that the murder could have been music related. Unfortunately, the Unsolved Mysteries episode did not lead to any arrest. The shooting had a terrible effect on Sammy Sadler. The shooting damaged his arm and he had problems playing the guitar. And even though Sadler was nearly killed in the shooting, some people believed that he was involved in the murder of his friend. As a result, his music career tanked. For years, the case sat cold. Then in 2001, Chuck Dixon died of cancer. After he died, some people came forward and said that Dixon had been running a scam involving music charts. Independent artists would pay him $1,500 to $2,000, then he'd bribe DJs at radio stations to play their music. As a result, their songs would chart higher. Chuck would also have some charts that Cashbox manipulated so that some artists appeared higher than they should have. Also, when there was a bullet icon, that meant the song was climbing the charts. Dixon would make sure that the people who were paying him had bullets next to their songs. At the time of his murder, Kevin Hughes wanted to change how the charts were made. He wanted to get information from radio stations that weren't loyal to Dixon. Hughes also refused to take bribes to manipulate the charts. It's believed that just before Hughes was killed, he was getting ready to blow the whistle on Dixon. Dixon never admitted to anyone that he had Kevin killed, but he did allude to it several times. For example, he told a former partner, if anybody gets in my road or anything happens in this cash box situation that gets in my road, the same thing will happen to them that happened to Kevin Hughes. A man named Richard Detonio worked as a bag man for Dixon so he would collect the bribes. Detonio also worked at Cashbox and he was the one who hired Hughes. The police decided to investigate Detonio. They noted at the time of the murder he had a back injury so he had an unusual gait. But he had an alibi for the time of the murder. He said he was with his wife and she confirmed his alibi. But they happened to get divorced a month after the murder. When the police talked to his ex-wife again, she admitted that Detonio was not with her at the time of the murder. In fact, he had asked her to lie for him. Also, black cat hairs were found in the hat left of the crime scene. At the time of the murder, Detonio owned a black hat. The police interviewed a friend of Detonio named Steve Daniel. Daniel lived in Flintstone, Georgia, which is about 137 miles from downtown Nashville. Daniel said on the day of the murder, Dan Antonio came to his house and purchased a 38 caliber pistol from him. A 38 caliber pistol was the murder weapon. Daniel said they test fired the gun in his backyard. Antonio left somewhere between 7.15 and 8 p.m., just before he left, he told Daniel to lie about when he left. But just before he departed, he told Daniel to lie about when he left. It takes about two hours to drive from Flintstone to Nashville, and the shooting happened around 11 p.m. So he had enough time to drive from Flintstone to Nashville, track down Hughes, and kill him. One thing that the police noted was that Daniel said he had test fired the gun in his backyard. They were able to recover a bullet from his backyard. It was compared to the three bullets pulled from Kevin Hughes' body. A firearm expert said that they were a match. In July 2002, 13 years after Kevin Hughes' murder, 56-year-old Richard Detonio was arrested. At the time, Detonio was living in Las Vegas, Nevada, where he worked as a pit boss at a casino. He went to trial in September 2003. 
At the trial, the prosecution alleged that D'Antonio murdered Hughes at the request of Chuck Dixon because he was worried that Hughes was going to ruin their scam. The trial only lasted two days, and then the jury deliberated for seven hours. Richard D'Antonio was found guilty of murdering Kevin Hughes and guilty of attempting to kill Sammy Sadler. He was sentenced to life in prison. Richard D'Antonio died 11 years later in September 2014 at the age of 67. Sammy Sadler continues to make music to this day. The bullet that nearly killed him is still on his shoulder. In 2019, he published a memoir called A Hit with a Bullet. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Don't forget to check out our new YouTube channel, Paranormally Listed. You can find it at youtube.com slash paranormally listed. Of course, we still have our original true crime channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for listening. Please take care of yourself and stay safe. <laughs>